Episode 7 just aired and we finally have our main villain. Stay tuned to find out who that is. Things get on the way with a somber and elegant funeral proceeding. Just a note here, as I've stated before, there are a lot of gaps in information that, we, that need to be filled with creative decisions when it comes to adapting fire and plot, due to the nature of the book. The House Valerian's unique sea burial method is one of those creative additions to the book which I appreciated greatly. The only thing that spoiled the scene was the uncle's obsession with blood being pure and not so subtle criticism of his nephew. Let me clarify, if his dig at Leno had been kept to one sentence, it would have been fine, even if still tasteless. Yet lack of nuance and subtlety is something that has been plaguing the series forever. Despite the strong start of the funeral scene, the rest of the gathering are found quite tedious and drawn out. It felt like the writers did not know what they wanted out of the post-burial gathering. Yet they were committed to dedicating a long portion of the episode to it anyway. At least we learned of the betrothal of Aegon II to his sister Helena. As more examples of lack of subtlety and tact ramp up, we have Lord Corlys who decides it's a good idea to remind everyone of Lenor's preference of company in front of everyone. This produced such an awkward situation which left me with so many questions. If Corlys wanted his son to come back and join everyone, why didn't he go do it himself? Lenor is his son and heir, his legacy. The real call is Valerian would go to his son and collect him himself with dignity and the respect he deserves. Snapping like that and airing his family's dirty laundry in front of the court is not like the sea snake at all. Sticking with Corlys, we are treated to an exchange with his wife Rhaenys. Every time these two are together in the scene, it's a gem, since both are great performers. However, the consequences of the writer's bad decisions from the beginning of the series continues to haunt us, as we see Corlys reminding Rhaenys of how the crown was stolen from her. This is simply not true. First of all, Rhaenys lost her claim when King Jaehaerys chose his remaining son, Balon, as heir after Rhaenys' father was killed. Considering Targaryens never had a clear set of succession rules at the time, the kings had complete discretion to choose the heir. That's exactly how we came to have Rhaenyra as heir to the throne. Secondly, the Council of 101 in truth considered two strong claims. Lenor Valarion's claim, which stemmed from Rhaenys being the daughter of a previous heir, and Viserys, who was the firstborn son of the other heir apparent. The writer's decision to alter the story so that the fight for the throne was to be between Viserys and Rhaenys in the first episode haunts us to this day. Lord Corlys Valerian keeps sounding like an idiot while his wife has to teach him wisdom. This is a theme in this show. While in truth, Corlys had a legitimate gripe. His son lost a bit to be the next king for which he had a good claim. Now that I stated the bad, let me voice my appreciation for the good in this scene. Rhaenys proposes a truly damaging and ill-advised decision and asks Corlys to openly out Lenor's sons as bastards by announcing Lena's daughters as heir to Griffmark. Here, the real sea snake finally turns up and soundly rejects this folly. To be honest with you, for a moment I was worried Corlys would actually do it. Thank the gods, he kept his head. Next up, we have the real meat of the episode served to us as Rhaenyra talks freely to Daemon and we get introduced to the real villain of the House of the Dragon. If you have watched my previous videos, you know that I kept stating that the showrunners either messed up with writing the young Rhaenyra or they were intentionally setting her up to be the villain of the show. To name a few glaring examples, we all witnessed that she was always ungrateful and held a grudge towards her father which came off as petty and baseless. That was despite the fact that Viserys had always loved her and actually gone as far as breaking all tradition and precedent by naming her heir and had never wavered in that. She was also hostile towards Alison after she married her father. She kept herself isolated at court and insisted on vying for solitude, knowing full well what being heir apparent to the throne meant. She made fun of a child in front of other nobles when she held court and let him be bullied until the boy had to draw his blade to defend his own honor. Yet not only she didn't lift a hand to stop the madness, she fled like a coward. She also seduced the knight of the king's guard to betray his vows, lied to her best friend, and demanded that the king fire his hand in return for her to do her duty to the realm. And now we see her admitting that she sees her husband as an object, a tool for her to do what she wanted, and now that her lover is dead, she refers to Lenor as a useless instrument. Now, he will be useless, or worse. We witness how much of a narcissist she is in this scene. She claims that she made an effort to keep up appearances, which shows her utter lack of self-awareness. 
I mean, in what way did she manage that? Her extramarital affairs are the talk of the court, and at least on the show, there seems to be no soul in Westeros who doesn't know who fathered her sons. <laughs> if you weren't convinced of Rhaenyra's true character, we see it in plain sight when she gaslights Daemon for refusing to abuse her when she was a child and accuses him of abandoning her. If that wasn't enough, she seduces her uncle right after he buried his wife. All the while, Rhaenyra herself being supposedly in mourning of her own loss notwithstanding. Don't get me wrong, I don't find this at all a weak spectacle. I was just not ready for Rhaenyra turning out to be the villain of the story. When I read Fire and Blood for the first time, I was fully Team Blacks. When I reread it as a preamble to watching the show, I saw some flaws in her, but I still favored her cause. Yet now, with all that has transpired over these seven episodes, I'm more and more moving away into a more neutral and spectator front. Right after this juicy scene, we get another brilliant one in the form of Aemon finally graduating to a real Targaryen by taming his first dragon. And boy, does this kid have a mission. Credit to the showrunners, this was handled superbly. They showed how Aemon had to fight for this privilege. I particularly liked the part where Aemon had to avoid getting hit by seagulls. The challenge itself had to be emphasized, since he went for the biggest, baddest she-dragon in Westeros. Vagal might be a bit long in the tooth and slower than others, but when it comes to size and strength, she's unrivaled. What transpired next was pretty much word for word from Fire and Blood, and that's why I loved it. The only difference was that they included Lena's twins here, however, I believe it was a good decision, since it's only natural that the girls would be upset at their mom's dragon being mounted. The aftermath was also thankfully faithful to the source material. I gotta say, I enjoyed every bit of it right until the melodramatic ending. At this point, it's not surprising to see such over-the-top scenes which have dogged the writing of House of the Dragon. Yet one has to wonder what purpose do they serve? I enjoy violence and spilling of blood in my TV shows and films as much as the next guy, but I struggle to see the point of Alison's batshit crazy moment. I've emphasized before that Alison is Queen Consort. She also has no Targaryen blood, therefore her status is much lower than Rhaenyra at court. When she took the dagger and launched for the princess and heir apparent to the throne, she basically struck at the king and the crown itself. A real king's guard would have knocked her out and incapacitated her. That is, if they felt kind at that moment. Unfortunately, the king's guard of House of the Dragon are just paper tigers. They're helpless grunts who serve no function and continue to fail their charges. This is another example where they serve as mere spectators while someone they have sworn to protect is fighting for her life against an armed assailant. One might argue that Alison is the queen. That's why they can't do anything. And that would be wrong. Alison is a high tower. She's queen only due to her marriage to Viserys. On the other hand, Rhaenyra is a Targaryen. She is of the royal line and the next ruler of Westeros. For the king's guard, this is a black and white situation. The life of the princess and heir apparent takes precedence over everyone but the king. Hell, even if Viserys tried to shank Rhaenyra, I'd wager the king's guard would have stopped him. No matter how you look at it, this addition to the plot served no purpose, made no sense, and was completely unnecessary. The only reason for it that I can come up with is an obsession with melodrama and gratuitous violence on the writer's side. Just to complete the thought on the Kingsguard, I'm still at a loss to explain a lack of protection for Rhaenyra. The princess should always be accompanied by her own designated contingency of Kingsguard, even when she is in Dragonstone. Yet at no point in the show have we witnessed it. The only time she had a Kingsguard dedicated to her was the short time when Criston called it so. It's worth remembering that Rhaenyra, just like all other heirs, had at least one brother of the king's guard with her at all times. Over the past two episodes, the show has portrayed Lainor in the worst light possible. Lainor is presented as an absent father who had a party with his boyfriends than be a father figure to his sons. He's depressed and incapable of doing anything productive. Rhaenyra goes as far as calling him useless. I was getting really concerned about such an unkind portrayal of him, but when he came to Rhaenyra and admitted to his faults, while promising to do better and be a worthy husband, my worries subsided to a great degree. What came next, of course, only served to pronounce Rhaenyra's status and the, as the main villain of the show. Not only she disregarded Lenor's epiphany, she planned an elaborate scheme to get rid of him so she could marry her uncle and have legitimate children. And that's where the show lost me. Why would Lenor agree to run away with Sir Ka, a no-name knight, to Essos right after he had a change of heart? especially since it came at such a great cost to his family and parents. Not only did this completely destroy the only good moment Lenor had, 
It also painted this whole faking of Leonor's death a cop-out solution. In Fire and Blood, Leonor is killed by his boyfriend in a bout of jealousy. Yet Daemon is also suspected of having a hand in it. House of the Dragon writers, however, for whatever reason, went against their source material. This would not have been an issue if they didn't totally shit the bed with such an idiotic ending. Episode 7, Driftmark, was a flawed gem. It had its brilliant moments, which shined brightly, but it was also marred with weak plot points and illogical and needless additions and alterations, which served no good purpose. I appreciate you all sitting through another one of my reviews. If you liked the video, tickle that like button, leave a comment and let me know what you thought of the episode. Also, make sure to subscribe and help grow my channel.